education. Um, this is actually, uh, uh, I have to admit that for the last many years, my uh, scholarship, research, and writing activities have taken me uh, away from the millionaire's unit, so um, you know, please forgive me if, if I'm rusty in talking about it at all. Um, occasionally I do get asked to do talks, so um, I'll go back there. Uh, but uh, I've been, uh, for the last several years, immersed in the period before World War II, uh, leading up to <coughs> Pearl Harbor. Um, and uh, that book, the current, the new book, started actually with, in part, with the Millionaire's Unit because at the end, uh, I was reading through uh, Robert Lovett's letters. Um, Robert Lovett, who commanded the, um, the Navy, the day portion of the uh, uh, Northern Bombing Group during World War I, um, and then uh, in later years became the Secretary of War, the Deputy Secretary of War for Air, during World War II, and the uh, Secretary of uh, Department of Defense in the Korean War. And for him, really, his entire uh, military career came out of his experience as the first uniformed American to fly, uh, to fly bombing missions during World War II, and his creation of the Strategic Bombing Force the first strategic bomber force in American history. Um, but at the end of the Great War, he wrote to his love and fiance and future wife Adele and said that we haven't finished the, the job. He said without exterminating what he called the Hun, we, we have passed on the necessity for our children one day to come back and complete the job, you know, and that was to me sort of a, uh, a sort of milestone that I said, now how could this man be so prescient? And uh, and I was always curious about that, and then I was curious about how it became possible for the U.S. not to get, uh, not to intervene in World War II. Uh, when the war had been going on for so long and there was an opportunity uh, early on when there were opportunities to stop Hitler and to uh, uh, thwart the Japanese. And that, uh, as I got deeper into that, I began to realize just how much the U.S. was actually neck deep in both wars, the Pacific Theater and the Atlantic Theater, well before Pearl Harbor. And uh, it became a fascinating subject for me, both the... Uh, the domestic scene where that was so heavily isolationist uh, after the in part after the experience of World War One and terror of returning to a, a European trench war, and then uh, uh, the at the same time that the country was going to war, clearly caught up deep in undeclared wars. Anyway, that's my new book. That's where my head has been. So I apologize if if I seem at all rusty in talking about about the uh, first Yale unit and the millionaires unit. Um, that book, um, my research on the subject actually began uh, with the League of World War One Aviation Historians. And so I thank you and salute you. I attended the uh, League's national convention in Seattle. In uh, this would have been in uh, 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 05, and uh, that was really my first um, deep exposure to uh, to the, the the extraordinary knowledge that you people possess and that I didn't, and. Uh, it, taught me just how much I needed to come up to speed. Um, and and uh, it also gave me some resources uh, to turn to people who really knew their stuff. Uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, Noel Shirley, um, who uh, wrote about a lot about the uh, um, naval aviation. And, 
And I also uh, ended up in touch with uh, Jeffrey Rosano, um, who's written books about naval aviation, a number of books now. Um, but with that, let's, let's turn to um, my talk. Now, frankly, uh, usually I talk to audiences that don't know a whole lot about the Great War. And so I apologize that I'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of in general terms about the war and uh, um, that you know like the back of your hands. Um, so, um, you know, if you ask most Americans they'll, uh, about uh, the First World War, uh, they'll say, well, you know, there was a World War II, so there must have been a First World War. Um, and, uh, but as you know, there was no more important event in 20th century history in terms of its impact on the world uh, and the consequences that we to this very day uh, continue to deal with. Um, first, of course, there was the collapse of centuries-long lo royal lines and nat national empires, the rise of communism in Russia that created the Soviet Union, the uh, post-war uh, societal collapses and conflicts that led to the rise of fascism, first in, under Mussolini in Italy, and then, of course, under Hitler in Germany. And of course, through that, the eventual causes of World War II, the Holocaust, and the creation of the lines of, uh, of nations in the Middle East that, of course, we are now still contending with. You know, why is Iraq there? Why is, why is Syria there? Why is Saudi Arabia there? These are countries that uh, were forged out of the aftermath of World War I. And of course, World War I was brought about the surge of the United States to becoming a global superpower. Basically, we, uh, in, uh, the industrialization of the United States was, became turbocharged in World War I, and uh, from that point, we were the, uh, the greatest industrial power in the world, even if we we're not the greatest military power in the world. You know, of course, most of what we think about the First World War is the appalling violence. You know, the more than 20 million who suffered injuries, the more than, and wounds, the more than 10 million military personnel and 7 million civilians who died in the war. That, in terms of military personnel, we, we have you think about it, there were 230 soldiers, sailors, and airmen who died for every hour that war lasted. Um, and, of course, the greatest uh, uh, image of that war, and the, and the image that had such an impact on isolationism in the United States, was the carnage along the ragged, ragged line of 1,200 miles of trenches dug through 440 miles of northern and eastern France, the, the Western Front, where in November 1914, the two uh, opposing forces stalled and then engaged in a four-year war of attrition that ultimately bled the great nations of Europe dry. Now, of course, the most, uh, perhaps the most infamous instance of carnage, uh, this July 1st will mark the centennial of the first day of the Battle of, of the Somme. British forces lost 54,470 uh, soldiers in combat that day, including more than 19,000 killed, almost all of them within minutes of the whistle calling them out of the trenches, kicking soccer balls ahead in what they believed would be a walk across the in obliterated en enemy lines. Um, no wonder the Europeans would now rather kick balls, uh, soccer balls in stadiums than, uh, you know, uh, try to fight out their national differences with each other. Although we're now starting to have this breakdown of Europe, and those of us with awareness of 
of just how awful that uh, that continuous uh, ethnic state conflict in Europe was. Have to question what what lies ahead. Um, now, as I said, um, you know Americans know so little about World War One and haven't been able to quite uh, grasp its significance with the, uh, the centennial. Um, the BBC ran 1,200 hours of original Great War programming uh, in the 2014 centennial year. Um, and the U.S. largely ignored the event. Um, and that's because in August 1914, President Wilson said to his countrymen, quote, be neutral in fact as well as in name during these days that are to try men's souls. Voters returned him to office in 1916 on the slogan of, he kept us out of war. Uh, he was an idealist. He didn't plan for war, thinking if you didn't build up for war, America would remain safe. Um, and of course, he was wrong. Um, and I should say, uh, I'm going to show some clips from the Millionaire's Unit documentary um, as we go along here. Uh, I was wondering how many of you have actually seen the full thing. It showed at the GI Film Festival. So only one. Good. All right. I mean, I'm sorry, Peter. You'll see, you'll see some repeats here. Um, but in that vein, so uh, there was a documentary uh, uh, inspired by my book. Um, and the documentary is a full-length documentary, feature-length documentary. Um, they have been in negotiations for broadcasts with PBS, but PBS has been going back and forth about how to mark uh, the Great War. They said the U.S. didn't enter the Great War until um, spring of 1917. You know, that's the point at which we, we should be doing programming. Um, so it's, um, it's, I think it's been quite unfortunate because uh, Americans... Uh, other than those who have a real devotion to, to the subject, have tended keep to our head in the sand, just like we did a century ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. ignore the fact that this month marks the centennial that the uh, Escadrille N124 became operational, mm -hmm. later known as the Escadrille Lafayette. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, so, uh, and in fact, uh, one of the filmmakers, Derek Greer is now working on a, a, a film about the, uh, the Lafayette Escadrille. So, um, you know, hopefully there'll be another high quality documentary out there uh, about uh, Great War Aviation, um, but hopefully both films will get out to the public. I think they're gonna have the DVD um, available for sale soon. Okay, let's get back to my book. Uh, let's fast forward to the early 1990s when I was an editor at the Yale Alumni Magazine. Um, the, um, uh, I didn't go to Yale, um, but I ended up uh, uh, being a writer and editor there. Um, I did an article about the Yale Flying Club, uh, founded by another aviation pioneer back in the um, uh, 1960s. Um, Let's see if anybody knows who Fred Smith is here. Yes, sir. FedEx. Yeah, he was the founder and still CEO of FedEx, uh, which uh, very nicely came in uh, at the 11th hour to provide the funding to complete the Millionaire's Unit paper documentary. Got a, his paper got a C in graduate school. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually have had uh, uh, had an exchange with him CD, when I did the, when I did this article. And there, it's a bit apocryphal. He did, he did do a paper uh, as an undergraduate about his idea for uh, on-time, real-time logistics uh, that the, the rise of computers was going to necessitate. As, as com he, he saw that as computers uh, and information technology was becoming essential to supply line development uh, enterprise-wide, that when these uh, broke down that they would cause essentially the entire system to go down for for companies and so that was his thinking now uh, he was a marine pilot in the Vietnam War uh, and then 
came back from there from, uh, and, and expanded that into what became FedEx. Um, he told me he, he did not get a C on the paper. Oh, wait, wait. Is that an urban legend, probably? Uh, I th he, said, he said it was B. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this was, this was at a time when, when uh, A's were hard to come by. So. Okay. Um, but, but it's a great story. <laughs> so. Um, so I went flying with, the, uh, with this modern incarnation of the Yale Flying Club for an article. And uh, while flying with them, they told me about this illustrious predecessor group from 1916, the Yale Aero Club. Uh, I knew nothing about them, and uh, very few people I spoke to did either. Um, but that squadron, uh, or rather that campus club of uh, primarily uh, yeah, uh, sort of s a self-selected group of Yale, primarily sophomores, um, became the beginnings of the Navy Air Reserve, which is uh, now the largest component of naval aviation. And when the U.S. did go to war in 1917, they became the nucleus of what quickly grew into a 40,000-man naval air service. Um, out of that 29-member uh, Yale Aero Club came the Navy's sole air ace of the war. Uh, as I mentioned, the first American in uniform to fly in a bomber, and the creator of the first American bomber force. Also the first uniformed American uh, to give his life in combat. And these were 18, 19, 20 year old kids uh, who had been college kids uh, just uh, months, or rather I should say a year before they went into the war. They also led after the war. All but one of the assistant secretaries of war and Navy <coughs> throughout the entire period from uh, the end of the Great War through World War II came from this group. And as I mentioned, uh, so too did Robert Lovett, the future Secretary of Defense. Um, nothing of substance other than uh, Peter's uh, article and, uh, in a magazine had really been written about them in 75 years. They had uh, two volumes that they self-published, uh, unit, uh, unit history uh, that they self-published in 1925, but there had been nothing book length that had uh, covered them in, in, uh, in those 75 years that followed. You know, but what, uh, but what really drove me to write about them wasn't so much um, what they had achieved as much as that was important, you know, because um, I came at this from, you know, uh, a personal interest in military history, uh, in part an interest as a journalist, um, and, but then I started reading the letters of uh, Kenneth MacLeish. Uh, Kenny MacLeish was the brother of Archibald, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner, and um, Jeffrey Rosano found a collection of letters um, that he wrote to his fiance Chloe, uh, I mean Priscilla Murdoch, excuse me, um, from this period where uh, where he was in part of became part of the Yale Aero Club and then uh, a member of the first Yale unit and then finally went off to war as a fighter pilot. Um, and uh, so he wrote many letters about his trials and. Uh, at war um, and his experiences on his mission and missions. And one of them that really grabbed me was when he talked about a mission that he was flying over Belgium. Um, his airplane, I apologize to this group, I don't recall the type of airplane he was flying. It was two seater with an observer in the back. Um, DH. Pro probably a DH, one of the. Um, <clears throat> and his airplane got hit by any aircraft craft fire. And he lost control of it, he lost power, um, and he was, while struggling to regain control, he sailed out over neutral Holland. And he could have ditched at that point. But he actually managed to regain partial power, partial control over the aircraft, and he banked it about, flew back over uh, the German uh, forces over Belgium, to fight again another day. Um, and so I was 
grabbed by this, uh, by this drive to be in the fight, uh, this need f uh, to, want this desire to be uh, something that we would today call a hero. Um, and this sense of idealism and patriotism, and this readiness for self-sacrifice, uh, which frankly, um, particularly at that time, uh, was, was so different than the Yale I knew. Now, I have to say that um, in the uh, time since my book came out, Yale has reestablished uh, ROTC on campus, and there's really much more of a sense that Yale is, cannot, does not stand apart from the, what is such a significant component of our society and national government uh, any longer. Um, so I began to read the papers of the first Yale unit, the Truby Davison papers uh, that are housed at Yale. And I contact families um, who gave me uh, access to letters, diaries, photos, and I found real treasury there. Uh, real treasure there. Um, Peter was showing me some, some of things from the Engels family that he's got in his collection. I was just like, oh, if I had had that stuff when I started out on the book in the phone book. You know, what did I know? What did I know? But great stuff. Great stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I'll try to move a little quicker um, about uh, the, um, uh, this very different world that these young man, men lived in at the time. Um, now I don't know if any of you know the Yale College campus. This is the, um, uh, the old campus, it's called. And as you can see, uh, they're out there doing morning calisthenics. Um, I don't know about you, but when I went to college, we did not get out every morning and do calisthenics. <laughs> um, Yale was a, a very different place from today. And uh, today we think of Yale as one of the great intellectual centers of, well, the entire planet, really. And back then, intellectual life was considered secondary on campus to extracurricular life. You know, uh, in fact, uh, the, there was, you know, if you were considered too, uh, the, that somebody who studied too hard, you were looked down upon. You know, they had some nasty names for you. Um, but what really mattered was how you drove the campus social life, its organizations. You had to show you had something they called sand. It was their version of character, which sand came from the idea of, you know, the way you, uh, the old locomotives, they would drop sand onto the rails to, for the wheels to catch, to drive the engine down the track. And you had to have sand in, uh, in Yale campus organization life, especially. And if you were, if you were successful in showing your sand uh, in that organizational life by being captain of a football team, editor of, of, of a newspaper or journal, uh, uh, manager of one of the, of, of the uh, athletic teams, you had a chance to be elected to one of the secret societies on the Yale campus. Um, uh, perhaps the most famous, the most mysterious, um, and the most talked about of, of them all is Skull and Bones. That's what they call their tomb. It's, uh, the clubhouses are scattered around New Haven, which is where I come from. Uh, there are these windowless, mausoleum-like buildings. Uh, most of them are actually quite a bit more ornate than Skull and Bones. Um, and this is where these secret societies carry on their secret doings. And, uh, you know, they're basically kind of <laughs> fraternal organizations now. They admit women. Um, but that they have their rituals. And, and um, But uh, Skull and Bones, in particular, has produced many presidents. Uh, and extraordinarily, if you think of the, was it the 2000 election? No, 2004, pitting um, two members of Skull and Bones against each other. You know, people think that these uh, secret societies actually run the world. Well, <laughs> maybe they do. Um, now, um, 
I was actually, I was interviewed on the History Channel about uh, a letter I discovered in the course of writing The Millionaire's Unit um, from uh, one member of Skull and Bones to uh, Truby Davison talking about robbing Geronimo's grave. Um, it had long been rumored that a group from Skull and Bones had gone to Fort Sill and uh, broken into the tomb of Geronimo and stolen his skull and brought it back to the tomb in New Haven. Um, and I actually found a letter from 1918 laying out what they did. Um, so this occasion, worldwide attention, was front page news on the Wall Street Journal. I was on CNN and uh, other international television. And there was news reports in India about this. It was quite an amazing thing. Um, and it was such a big deal what happened with Skull and Bones that Tap Day, as it was called, the day you were elected to one of these secret societies, uh, was national news. Newspapers would report on who at Yale was actually chosen for these events. And they would have this big public ceremony. Um, and that was sort of the only point at which you were marked out as officially as a member of one of these secret societies. Um, now, yes? What was the criteria of acceptance? Was it uh, you know, pedigree sure. or money? Or <laughs> well, <laughs> pedigree was already sort of a given. You know, Yale at that point was a kind of cousinhood of uh, of generally people from who had gone to prep schools, who had had known each other, who came from old old families, old and big money, um, and so there was already that high social layer there. But to then get sort of called to Valhalla of a Yale student, that was you had to show, it was a combination of things, both that your activities on campus were exemplary, that you had been, um, uh, as I mentioned, captain of, of, a, of a sport team, uh, leader of, a, of another cam of a campus organization. Your father may have been a member. Father may have been a member, that includes, uh, I'll tell you this, Truby Davison, who was a member of Skull and Bones. His son was a member of Skull and Bones. His grandson today is the president of the, of the organization that operates Skull and Bones. <laughs> so yes, there is, a, there is a significant legacy component of this. Now, don't tell anybody I told you this. And if there are any members of Skull and Bones here, they would have already walked out. <laughs> um, but... Uh, uh, it was a big, big deal back then. It's not such a big deal anymore. Uh, most of the stuff has kind of become immersed in a much more democratic campus um, and a place where, uh, as I mentioned, that intellectual life has become much more important. At what point in your academic career was this selection made? This was it's almost like they had to have had a year or so. Sure, this is this is a good good question. Um, the at the end of their junior years. So then they would get together throughout their senior year, going through their, their rituals of bonding. And uh, Skull and Bones keeps a, um, they have an island on, in the, uh, somewhere on the Saint, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada, and I guess they have retreats there. Um, but, but basically, it, it was uh, through their senior year. At the end of the junior year, this ceremony would take place, and you would be selected for the various clubs. And then uh, at, during the, your senior year, you would have regular uh, 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 meals with your, your club mates. And they had, you know, whatever rituals they have. You know, I went through these papers, and I mentioned that Geronimo letter. And there, are, there was a, uh, a letter from William Howard Taft to Truby Davison in there. William Howard Taft, the, of course, president and later chief justice of the Supreme Court, and he's writing to young Truby Davison, and he signs the letter in yours in 322, which is code words for skull and bones, and draws a little skull and bones on it. You know, so they were, uh, they had their own, they, they had their, their own uh, code names, they had various coded language for what they, 
uh, for, uh, for their activities. And there's all these letters in there um, that, uh, that talk about uh, what was going on with Skull and Bones at the time. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, you know, now we think of Yale as this place of great intellectual uh, 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 ferment, and, but what it was back then was a place that was sports mad. Um, the, uh, the Harvard and Yale were the Yankees and Red Sox of their day, the Redskins and the Cowboys, um, and they would get, um, uh, they built in 1914, they built the largest stadium built in the world since the Roman Colosseum. And every weekend, 80,000 people, in the fall, 80,000 people would come out to see the Yale football team play. You know, nowadays, other than the Harvard game, they're lucky if they have 10,000 people out there. Um, but also amazing uh, to talk about some of the changes in culture was how important crew racing was. Um, crew racing was a national sport back then. I don't know, how many of you actually follow crew? Well, so one, that's, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, back in uh, the good old days, back in the, uh, actually right through into the 1950s, uh, almost everybody with an interest in sports would have followed what was going on with the crew teams. Um, you know, there's been this recent book, The Boys on the Boat, um, uh, about how, uh, how significant that crew team was um, in, in, in the national consciousness. Um, and the, every uh, once a year a, in June, there's the great Yale Harvard boat race. It's held on a river in Connecticut called the Thames River. Both Yale and Harvard maintain um, for this one p boat race a year, they maintain a training quarters there. And they go there and they train before the race. And there used to be back in, the, the in 1916, the reporters would be around the training quarters and they would report what was going on with the crew teams and how they looked in preparing for the big race. And then the big race would come. It was a four mile race on the Thames River um, above New London and Groton where the submarine base is. Um, and you can see the, there are two boats and there would be a, a train, uh, an observation train completely sold out that would run down the river and more than 100,000 people would line the river and they said that you could walk the length of the four mile course um, over the water from boat to boat and never get your feet wet. You know, it was the beginnings of the <coughs> social season. It was, uh, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, well, it was uh, the sporting event, event that, that mattered. Um, now the reason I mention this is um, that there was a, an assistant crew team manager. So this is somebody vying to become the manager of the crew team, named Frederick Truby Davison, whom I mentioned earlier. And he's in the summer, uh, so in June 1916, he was there at the, at the Yale training camp with the crew team, um, and he talked to, his, to the crew team members and the others out there um, uh, about his experiences the previous summer of 1915, where he had been driving ambulances, hauling the wounded back from the front to Paris. Um, he saw just how gruesome the carnage was from the war. He never actually, at that period, got to the front. Um, but he... Uh, Frederick Truby Davison was the son of the managing partner of J.P. Morgan, which was providing the uh, loans that were financing the, uh, the Allied powers, France and, and Great Britain, in their fight. Um, he thought that the U.S. would inevitably have to get into the war. And he felt that air was the place for him to be and for his friends. So he uh, came back and talked with his, uh, uh, many, particularly in the Yale crew team, about what was going on in Europe. Um, 
Now, uh, I'm going to zoom through this, but, uh, you know, while all this was, uh, while the U.S. was sitting on the sidelines, the war had been going on. And as you know well, aviation had been advancing tremendously. This, by the way, I, I got this photo uh, from the uh, university, I was at the University of Texas, Dallas, give a talk. They have, they have a really wonderful collection if you're ever uh, in Dallas, take, take time to get to their collection. This, uh, they have uh, volume after volume of, of uh, photo albums of German squadrons and aircraft. Um, really, uh, you, you folks will find it amazing. Um, and of course, as you know, in, the, in those first two years of the war, aviation had grown by leaps and bounds um, in that uh, effectively everything we associate with modern uh, or at least World War II aviation had largely come into a rudimentary beginnings, except for, except for radar. And of course, as you know, the casualty rates were enormous as they flew in these uh, wood and canvas uh, mo uh, box kites with, uh, held together by piano wire with uh, motors that were, um, you know, could, were often undependable, guns that often uh, stopped firing. So that summer of, at the, uh, after his, the experience with the crew team, um, Truby Davison enlisted 11 of his friends uh, t to spend the summer training, learning to fly. So he brought his friends together at the family's estate on the North Shore of Long, Isle of Long Island, uh, Great Gatsby Land. Uh, this is the old uh, Davison place at Peacock Point. Uh, they, the, he and his friends bunked at the top of the house. Uh, they had uh, 45 rooms in that house to wander among, 60 waterfront acres, uh, 50 servants. Um, but they were serious about learning to fly, and they did so from the ground up. They were uh, learning how to fly on, a flying, on flying boats, <clears throat> and uh, they, uh, they really were serious about uh, about what it took to become pilots. Um, but of course they did it in their white bucks and their rep ties. And, um, so, uh, but Truby actually wanted to put th the group into the Navy's service. And being the son of the head of, of J.P. Morgan, he was able to go down to Washington where he met with um, the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniel, uh, Josephus Daniels, um, uh, Carl, you don't answer this if you remember. Uh, anybody here uh, know uh, where the, uh, the f phrase Cup of Joe came from? It's because he didn't like drinking alcohol, and so that was, that was the only drink of choice for people in the Navy once, be once he became Secretary mm -hmm. of the Navy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, took, he took away their, uh, their the traditional rations of rum and uh, and, grog and, uh, and it became a cup of joe that they uh, drank uh, on shipboard. Eat it out or well, it's grape juice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they went to see Josephus Daniels. The Navy was the most technologically uh, advanced of the, of the uh, American military services. Um, their first air experiments began in 1910. Um, as you know, Eugene Eli making the uh, first ship launch. Um, but the Navy had largely abandoned its air service. There was no money uh, for it, or the, you know, the, what little they gave uh, was really not sufficient to, uh, to carry out much of anything down in Pensacola. Um, officers were not permitted to fly. It was considered far too dangerous. Um, and, the, uh, and Josephus Daniels said, you boys are great, but go back to college. We don't need you. Um, they continued to, to fly. There was a young assistant secretary who uh, offered to give them all the help he could. Um, and that was a man named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
and he would, of course, call them back to service 25 years later. And he did help them to set up relations at when they came back to Yale in the fall of 1916 uh, with uh, the Groton submarine base. And they would go up, some of the uh, young men, would, uh, Truby Davis in particular, would go up to Groton, and they would fly with the Navy to see how hard it was to spot a submarine at, uh, from, as it went below the surface. And the Navy was learning a lot from them as well. Um, those 11, uh, those tw original 12 grew to be 29. Um, uh, at Yale, they studied aviation. A few of them flew. Um, and all the while, uh, war raged in Europe, and particularly as concerned the United States at sea. Uh, German U-boats avoided American ships, especially after sinking the, the Lusitania the previous year. But the Kaiser's chief admiral promised that if the Kaiser permitted unlimited warfare at sea, he would starve out the Allies. And he promised no American troops would ever reach the front. They began to attack American ships that were part of the uh, uh, lifeline to the British and the French. And even President Wilson could no longer ignore the reality that war could not be avoided. Um, and suddenly, an entirely unprepared nation was entering a vast, modern, three-dimensional battlefield. And the Yale uh, Aero Club members, uh, which had, would become known as the first Yale unit, were the first college students called up in the land, even before the formal de declaration of war in April 1917. Uh, they were the first Naval Air Reserve squadron in history. Still, the Millionaires Unit, as the press came to dub them, had to supply their own airplanes, their own base, and their own instructors. And that was no problem for the Gold Spoon Brigade. The entire Navy Air Reserve, uh, including all their aircraft, was put on a three-car private train. They shipped out to Palm Beach, where they bunked at the Breakers to start. And if you know the Breakers, this is not your typical uh, Naval Air Station barracks. <laughs> Um, there they trained with their own, uh, with their own uh, instructors, as well as some Navy supplied officers. Um, nearly all of them learned to fly and soloed on flying boats. Um, and the... Uh, Is that a Curtis? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't... Uh, yes, they were flying um, the uh, Curtis F. Uh, Bat boats. I'm sorry? Bat boats. Bat boats? Bat boats. B A T. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, it was basically, they were basically um, uh, sportsmen's boats. You know, they were not, they didn't, uh, they had no armament on them, um, but these were um, the standard, at that point, Navy trainer. Didn't J.C. Penny buy one of them? Um, the, guy, the guy who had the, the uh, department store? You know, um, I'm, I'm not sure, but it was it was sort of a rich man's toy. Um, and uh, But they were learning to fly on these. And um, you can see here the entire squadron, um, uh, you know, including some of their civilian helps in their, um, in their uh, uh, Palm Beach uh, wear. Um, but they were, um, uh, and you could see that they themselves uh, kept themselves looking dapper. Uh, they had a lot of fun down there, but they also had a lot of serious effort to uh, uh, to learn aviation. And they um, did so they were completely self-funded all this time. At completely self-funded, they they were funded by J.P. Morgan, by uh, Rockefeller family, by Davison family, by um, a number of the other families putting up uh, putting up money to support but them. They were using military installations, or, nope. or not? They were using. Nope. nope. This was this. They were uh, they they were hangars eight that were set up for them here. They uh, lived at a hotel. This is on Lake Worth in uh, Palm Beach County, sort of across the. It's Lake Worth. Palm Beach is on uh, one side of Lake Worth and West Palm Beach is considered the other side. 
Um, but um, they sort of laid down the, uh, the DNA for uh, future naval aviators. There was this kind of cockiness that they had, uh, uh, a need to be fashionable, to look dapper, to be, uh, um, to think uh, that you were better, or maybe the best. Um, and they also had a big love of fun. They returned north uh, as the weather heated up in Florida. Um, and they uh, went to uh, another mansion on the uh, north shore of Long Island in Huntington, Long Island, um, where all were among the first 100 naval aviators to get their wings of gold, uh, in their case, made at Tiffany's. <laughs> yes? When did they first become members of the Navy? Uh, before, when they were called into service at before the declaration of war. So at the end of March, they were all, um, they all became ensigns. They had military ranks. Then. Yeah, they, had, they were all ensigns. They uh, uh, went up to uh, Groton to the sub base where they were all formally enlisted. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, as I, um, all of them except one got his wings. And that one was Truby Davison. And when you read my book, you'll find out why Truby didn't get his wins. Um, so in August 1917, they began to ship out to do everything for a country that had an air service at that point smaller than Bulgaria's. Some trained others. Uh, some of them were uh, stationed here in uh, Washington uh, with the uh, Naval Aeronautics Bureau working on uh, weaponry and uh, testing weaponry. Uh, some went up to uh, Buffalo where they were testing new engines that were being uh, built. Um, but, uh, and others were, uh, were building bases. Uh, one member of the Yale unit, Earl Gould, became the youngest uh, head of a naval aviation station ever um, at Key West, Florida. He ended up with more than a thousand men under him uh, when he was 23 years old. Uh, old man. I'm sorry? Old man. <laughs> old man, <laughs> yeah. Um, but most eventually went to Europe. And they were literally among the very first Americans to reach the continent. Uh, I mentioned Robert Lovett. Lo Robert Lovett went to Mushik, where he um, uh, was involved with literally building America's first naval air station overseas um, from scratch. And he took the first American airplane out of a crate and, and put it together and, uh, for flying there. Um, but uh, many of them at the start flew submarine patrols. Uh, they were sent over as, um, as uh, uh, kind of in a diplomatic way, a diplomatic mode, that they were uh, the first Americans who were assigned to fly with the British as kind of a vanguard, as well as uh, those who went into France as a vanguard. Um, they were actually the first Americans uh, to get over there. Um, they, as I said, they flew, they flew uh, uh, submarine patrols on the spider web over the channel in the North Sea. Um, and they escorted convoys. Um, and so, of course, the Navy has finally started realizing, you know, if you have an airplane that's way up above and circling out, you're going to see a whole lot more than you will from the conning tower of your, of your you know, the, the crow's nest, rather, of your, um, of your ship. Um, now, the... Uh, the Kaiser's admiral who vowed that no doughboys would ever reach the tent trenches proved terribly wrong. And by, the, uh, by 1918, more than an, a million American soldiers made it across. Uh, there were no uh, transports under convoy that uh, were ever sunk. But 
that work could prove very dangerous. So now I'd like to show you one of the film clips. Should, um, how do I, should I hit escape to get to? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. And, we'll go, and the clips are underneath here? That, uh, yeah, that should be. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Double click. Drag that, see where the hooker oh. is, drag that to the right. Yeah. Just click on the, Just click uh, on the, the, arrow. the, the arrow on the mouse. Albert Sturdivant missed several <coughs> patrols because of bad weather. His assistant, John Boyden, said Boyden's allowed him to take his place on patrol. And when this particular flight came up, apparently Al turned to Marnie's and said, "How about switching places with me? You know, you you got you got the uh, the chance to go, but I I haven't had as many chances because it's been such bad weather." Sturgis went out on that patrol, faced him under an attack by a squadron of German fighter planes. His plane was shot down. It appeared to survive on the water. But later on, when the uh, Germans came back to look for them, they were gone. Albert Sturdivant became the first U.S. naval aviator killed in combat. Now, I talked about, uh, oh, let's go back to the slides. Control. Control off. Anyway. So okay. you, can you can see the button uh, on the, just to the right of the center. Uh, right there, there you go, right there. I think right. that's. Okay, I mentioned uh, Robert Lovett seven, several times. Um, Robert Lovett was brilliant. He was a socialite who'd never, and member of Skull and Bones, um, uh, who'd never run anything bigger in his life than the junior prom at Yale. Um, but once he joined the Navy, he rose very swiftly up the ranks. His brilliance was quickly recognized, um, and he became uh, an assistant in the uh, aviation uh, headquarters in Paris. Um, drawing on his knowledge about logistics that he got from working with his father, who was the uh, chairman of the board of the Union Pacific Railroad. Back when the Union Pacific Railroad, now it's a big, it's a big system. Back then, the Union Pacific Railroad was the world's largest transportation network, and he knew for, uh, he would go out on an inspection tour with his father of, of the rail lines, and he knew that uh, that the rail system operated with a, uh, a very large percentage of its locomotives either being uh, refurbished or refueled uh, at, their, uh, at their stations, you know, that, at their rail yards. Uh, during, and that during those moments, there was a, you know, a large concentration of, of those machines there. And he thought, we are, we're running the submarine patrols out over the vast areas of sea, looking for German U-boats that sometimes are submerged, sometimes are on the surface, but it's effectively looking for a needle in the haystack. He said, let's see what we could do by attack, uh, if we can find and attack their submarine pens, which were in Bruges and Zerbrugge 
and Ostend on the Belgian coast. He wanted to find out for himself what it took to run a night bombing campaign, a heavy night bombing campaign. So, um, as you can see, um, he eventually he became the commander of the the um, of the Northern Bombing Group. The, um, he had more than a thousand aviators under his command, the first night bomber wing in American history. Um, there's a whole story to be told about the Northern Bombing Group and about what happened, why it, it proved not to be effective. Um, but 25 years later, when, uh, when Robert Lovett came back as, uh, to be the civilian head of the Army Air Corps, he understood just how important strategic bombing was uh, and how important overwhelming might was in running a strategic bomber force and the, the great bomber force that emerged in World War II can be directly traced to his experience here. Now let's go back and we'll see another clip uh, which um, is, it, is it here? It's the uh, folder on the, the folder on the, uh, the folder on the uh, left. All the way to the left. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, he was the first uniformed American to go out on a bombing mission. Exciting. Gee, guys. No sooner had we crossed the lines that the Huns had started to spray us. Archie Burses, who seemed the right man, but boy, it was straight. Presently, the motors were throttled, and we were gliding in for our mark. I had the three guns ready, and then, good God, the earth seemed to open. Seventeen searchlights sprang out and swept about. The attack made a wall of floor ahead of us. The deadly high explosions crumped about us, and the green balls swayed and spiraled as they sought to get us on fire. Roy kept straight on, never a waver or a turn. on straight through the intense wall of bursting shells ahead and below us. Suddenly, one light got us, and the whole 17 hit us with a slap. We felt like little kids caught stealing jam. Then I got the guns going. The tracers darted down the beams toward the gun crews, and two lights went out. The tip of the gun got red, and the glow crept up the barrel. And we were hit time and again. Why we were literally blown out of the air, I don't know. I saw a tear in the fuselage side, holes in the wings, and Roy's face grinning at me in front, and I could have cried. I felt so lucky to have been through it when I was safe. Okay. Okay. Um, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to zoom here. I, I'm supposed to be up at noon for, for at a museum <laughs> store, so I apologize. Um, of course, what they had mostly trained uh, to do, and what was sort of the height of their ambition, was to become a fighter pilot. Uh, this is David Ingalls. Uh, Peter afterwards, maybe he'll share some of his pictures of David Ingalls. I don't know if he, uh, but. David Ingalls became the Navy's fir first air ace. Um, he was uh, a young, kind of wild um, hockey player um, and uh, was willing to go in and do sort of scary, amazing things with his, uh, 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 as a fighter pilot. Now before then, um, he and And Kenneth McLeish, uh, remember, uh, we're learning how to. Uh, Over on the left. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're learning how to fly camel, camels, and I'll 
Uh, I think what I'll have to do is end with this clip here. Maybe I'll summarize briefly right after. Um, and then if there are further questions, if there are questions, discussion, we can talk about it, talk about things. But uh, this, uh, this is such, I find these clips from, uh, from the documentary are so magnificent. Um, they went to, to do this, to shoot these uh, camel footage. They went to New Zealand, the filmmakers. Um, the, um, New Zealand is the home to forgotten his name, the Peter director Jackson. of Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson, Jackson. Sir Peter. Sir Peter has, uh, as it sounds like I don't have to tell you, the, one of the world's uh, great collections, the Vintage Aviator, um, that uh, where they are building literally with, uh, on the spark plugs, uh, they have crimped in there the, the Vintage avi Aviator symbol. They are they build them from original plans when they're able to get them. Uh, aircraft, some of those aircraft, one of them was used in King Kong. Um, and there was a point at which uh, Sir Peter was going to direct a remake of the Dam Busters, um, the World War II story. And he had a number of... Um, the Lancasters? Yeah, the Lancasters rebuilt, uh, or built for to make the film. but. Um, but uh, I've never been there, but I've told it's, it's an amazing thing to see this collection. And so they welcomed the filmmakers in who, um, you know, maybe one day you can get them to come talk about the experience of going up in helicopters with, with uh, uh, cameras um, and then using uh, Go, GoPro cams uh, on, the, uh, on the pilots. But their enthusiasm reached delirious heights after they were introduced to the Southwood Camel. early January of 1918, while they were training at the British Foreign School at Gosport, England. They were absolutely overjoyed. Whether dangerous or not, they loved this thing. I finally took a ride in the camp. Scout single seater fighting machine. It's so touchy it just seems to jump if you shiver. It goes into a spin every time you take a turn unless you do it perfectly. I was full of pride that I got back into the same world as when I started. It is a very aggressive airplane. It's a huge amount of power. spins with the propeller, you have a tremendous amount of gyroscopic force, which means that that rotating mass forces the airplane to dive when you're turning to the right and climb when you're turning to the left. So that rotating mass. They wrote home to their parents describing the antics they engaged in in these aircraft, fighting each other in, in mock battles. They also carry out an activity they call bush bouncing which was to take your airplane down to about 25 or 50 feet off the ground, race at full speed, approach a house, a tree, a herd of cattle, a farmer, and then jump up in the air over him and then come right back down to earth. They absolutely were in love with this machine. So they, they Ingalls first flew with um, with the uh, British 213th, um, and then he was replaced uh, after he had this amazing string of victories. In very six weeks, he had uh, uh, he uh, 
was credited with, I think, six, but probably had seven kills. Um, and um, then he was pulled back. Kenneth McLeish, whom I mentioned at the beginning as the, the initial inspiration for me to think that, uh, that I should write a book about these guys, Kenneth McLeish was brought back, uh, came and replaced him. He had originally, uh, for a long period af after this training on camels, he had been uh, an easterly uh, as part of the uh, receiving end for the first American planes that were bring, being brought over. Uh, then he got Spanish flu. Fortunately, he survived. Um, but then he went and replaced Ingalls at the front. Um, and I normally finish, I'll just tell you quickly, the, by reading this, a passage. His closest friend from Yale, Artemis Gates, had been shot down and disappeared and Kenny was convinced that he had been killed. And he came back with revenge in mind, which is a dangerous state of mind to go up into the air with. And so uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, I appreciate your indulgence uh, of somebody who uh, is far below you in his, uh, in his knowledge of, of great war aviation and who admires deeply what you've done. Um, and um, I welcome a few questions. We have three minutes. <laughs>